Welcome to Sneaker University, the one place where you can learn the entire process of sneaker design from scratch. Ten steps from thumbnail sketching, engineering, CAD development and rendering for presentation, outsole design and drafting, and spec and pattern construction drawing preparation for pullovers and prototype perfecting, and production sample confirmation, including every other step and stage in between. Learn from a pro. I'm Cyrus L. I perfected this process over the span of my career in the footwear industry with over 10 million pairs of kicks sold, hundreds of designs created and produced. I came into the industry as one of the top artists in the country and I learned to parlay my artistic ability into pure industrial design and engineering and quickly earned a name as a great designer working with endorsed athletes as the director of basketball and cross training at one of the major brands. And now, well established with my own brands, you can learn this lost process from the best in the industry. Let's go. Classes in session. Welcome back to Sneaker University. This is episode number five, Outsole Design. And on this episode, I'm gonna show you how to execute uh, what is pound for pound, one of the two most important stages in developing your sneaker design. If the uh, execution of your thumbnail is probably the first, uh, the development of your outsoles design itself is easily the second, if it's the second and not the first. Um, this is because on any great sneaker, the outsole is absolutely key. You know, if you have a lame outsole, you're going to end up with a lame product or vice versa. A great outsole makes a great, great, great product, a timeless product. And, uh, you know, this also needs to be done uh, in such a way that it dovetails. I'm going to show you how to do this in an efficient way uh, so that it dovetails with the development of your uh, drafting, the outsole drafting. And we're going to do this by, I'm going to show you how to do this by working on your outsole design on a template uh, that is the same template that's going to be used for your outsole drafting. Although this will be freestyle sketching of the outsole that you can kind of, you know, do a lot of experimentation and research to kind of find what you want in terms of the, de the design. And you'll be able to shake out the design in somewhat, uh, almost the same manner as you uh, research your thumbnail sketch um, as well as uh, use you know, use the light box and overlays to reach your final um, drawing in the engineering process, final drawing, uh, actual size drawing, final line drawing of your upper pattern. Um, we're going to use that to develop the outsole. And this is very important because you really only have three or four months, give or take, uh, to reach your prototype and be ready to pull up on that, uh, you know, sale season, actually, which is in... Uh, August or uh, February of each year, you know, so you don't have a lot of time to waste. And it's critical that you, you know, that we develop the outsole at this particular point in the schedule because uh, as soon as you finish your colorways, you have your complete CAD, you got to go directly into your outsole design so that way you can be prepared to hit your drafting because the drafting of your outsole is the first thing you need to send over to the factory to have them start developing that because it takes roughly about 45 days to get through the entire process of uh you know get it receiving and correcting your shop drawing getting your wooden models and then for the factory to cut the steel test the mold assuming you don't make any errors you know and have to do a second outsole or an outsole correction which is can be devastating to that schedule you want to send that out first because uh, between the development of your outsole and also long stage process like uh, development of materials, which is also 30 days. If you pick a special leather or a special material that has to be developed, um, it takes 30 days. You don't want your prototype to be waiting around for that to come back. So if you spend, send your specs out, then you draft your outsole and send your outsole out, you're going to be waiting a while. 
you know but if you send your also out first while that's cooking you know while that's baking if you will um, you could be working on your tech pack then you send your pullover and stuff out after that you know construction drawings then you get your pullover because the pullover takes significantly less time actually to turn around being about a week or two um, so let's get into the outsole design On this episode, I'm gonna introduce you to a process that's used uh, and very important uh, to footwear design, and that's uh, the process in which you add texture uh, to your outsole, midsole, um, or any molded parts. Um, these textures are called, in the footwear industry, they're called stipples. Um, so you select a stipple pattern, right? You, they come in various different ways from the classic sandblast or um, you can have uh, different type of leather uh, looks, elephant patterns, uh, geometric patterns like ribs and stripes. There's literally hundreds of different type of textures that you can use um, to add to your outsole and it adds that extra dimension uh, to the design. Any one of your favorite shoes, you know, take a real close look at the rubber or the molded parts and you'll notice that there's these textures on there, uh, stipple textures. Here you have a set of stipple plates um like a notepad made of rubber this is an old set um and they are distributed by the uh factories individually um and they have each one of the textures on it right so as you select your texture for your outsole uh textures can be used on your midsole any uh hardware part uh you get your you get them from a book like this. Again, uh, you know, flexible rubber, and they usually can fit about, this one actually has 16s, front and back. Uh, and each te uh, texture is slightly different. So when you see the texture on an outsole, uh, I'm not sure how well you can see these. Um, they're all specifically selected uh, from a book like this. This one comes from a uh, factory in Pusan, this is a Korean set. Um, they probably got them from the mold maker uh, who supplied them to the factory and just like materials. Um, you know, each factory has their uh, preferred material supplier. They have their preferred uh, mold makers and the mold makers provide these stipple patterns, which the codes, this is actually um, has a DW code on it. Uh, the codes are different for each um, outsole supplier. You know, and I, I'm not sure how you, where the outsole suppliers get them from, that they're probably even more general. Um, but they differ from factory to factory. If there's a different supplier with a different set of uh, stipple codes, uh, your standard sandblast might be a different code than it would be for this particular, uh, you know, for the particular factory that uh, you got your plates from. And what you need to do is you have to learn how to uh, utilize stipples that come uh, from the factory in the form of stipple plates um, like the ones that you're seeing on the screen now um, rubber books rubber plated books that have you know literally you know, hundreds of uh, stipple pet uh, patterns uh, in each box assigned to a serial number um, you have to select a stipple based on what you want uh, to have applied to each part of your outsole you know, why you use a particular texture in a certain space on the outsole is, um, it depends on various different things. You know, how you want your design to actually function, if it actually has a functional purpose where it's doing additional wiping or gripping, uh, the type of grip, the type is based off of the type of surface uh, and the use of the shoe, whether it be indoor, outdoor, basketball, running, etc. Um, sometimes it could be purely aesthetic, meaning you just want to have a certain type of a look. Maybe it matches something on the upper pattern. Uh, a lot of times it's very instinctive. You know, it's kind of like a, you know, it's like an instinct that you have that you want your design to have a certain look for some reason that comes maybe some from somewhere totally different. Um, but once you have your idea, you look for the stipple in the book. Or if you don't have an idea, you really want to be careful of leaving too many surfaces just raw. Raw EVA with no uh, texture at all raw pvc with no pet texture at all not even glossy you know because gloss um surface is a texture in itself you know if you want something to be shiny or if you want it to be matte or light mid or heavily sandblasted or anything else yeah um 
You know, you need to kind of develop a, 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 an idea for what you want to do with that. And the more you add stipples onto the upper and they're good stipples versus just totally random, it actually makes a difference between whether a shoe is really good, really nice to handle uh, and intense or just missing something. Once you've selected your stipples, I'm going to show you how to actually add that to your blueprint um, drawing uh, information. After you finish your blueprint, there's uh, certain callouts that you use those serial numbers applied to each of the stipples. Uh, make sure that the out uh, the factory is clear on where on the outsole each of those stipples actually go. So now you know. You know you know about stipple plates. This is what they look like, um, and you and you're aware of the fact that you need to actually uh, consider and call out uh, your textures on each of the areas of your molded parts of the outsole. And with that, let's get back into this design um, process itself uh, for the outsole. So when you begin uh, to create your uh, uh, outsole uh, design, which will be based off of the uh, final line drawing that you worked on um, in your engineering final line, uh, uh, comes after your thumbnail. You, so you take your thumbnail, you, you build your actual size drawing. Uh, you need to use the last in all of these steps. Um, really, you want to take this is a la this is a typical athletic footwear uh, last. Um, and uh, I mean, this this may be uh, probably a basketball last. It's a hint to me because of the the mid cut height. Um, this is probably a last that I use at some point. Uh, for basketball, I'm just using as a quick reference for uh, for this uh, demonstration. When you're doing your engineer drawing, aka final line drawing, you want to take a picture of your last from the side and fit the side wall, the side view drawing of your upper uh, around the last, so it's as accurate as possible. Uh, when building the also, you also need the last. It's a must um, because also design is an exact science, very exact. Um, typically what you have uh, as you build your um, outsole, you'll have uh, five views, including the toe view. You'll see later on, you got uh, your medial side and lateral side view, and then you'll have your heel in the back, as well as the base of view. In order to get the base view of the drawing, which is basically the bottom of the sole, you gotta take the last and you, and you trace it um, onto a sheet of paper. I'm actually using uh, for most basic purposes, like I said, I actually tend to use, uh, this is a piece of printer paper, specifically 11 by 17, uh, AKA ta a tabloid sheet of paper. And I realized years ago after doing, you know, doing my draftings on a large piece of vellum that it could actually even more easily be done on a piece of uh, tabloid sheet of paper. Um, and, uh, and you'll see why as we go along in the process. Tabloid allows you to fit perfectly the five views on most uh, shoes, uh, uh, outsole uh, types. This last specifically is a size nine. You can see the nine is still marked there on the top. Uh, size nine is what you use, what's used on all prototypes in the footwear industry for men's. Um, women's is a little different. I can't remember from women's is like a seven and uh, boys, uh, uh, youths and infants are different sizes, but the standard for a men's uh, therefore, for the most basic and first generation of your outsole, unless you're building it for women's only, is a size nine. So in the size nine, men's last will fit on a piece of tabloid paper and allow you enough room uh, in the front for the toe view. Uh, uh, like I said, medial, lateral, and heel. So what I'm gonna do first is uh, uh, do a template. I'm gonna build a template that we'll be using as we uh, do, do overlays, because the overlay process that I showed you in uh, thumbnailing, as well as uh, doing your engineering, episode one and episode two, uh, engineering your final drawing, that same process with a light table is what you use when you're designing your outsole, right? The details of the outsole, which at this point, um, you only have a rough idea. What you have is what you finalized in your uh, 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 final line drawing. You have the sidewall view from the medial side. And then in your thumbnails, you had, you should have worked on thumbnails that actually show you little um, um, concepts for your outsoles, right? So now you gotta take all of that and make an actual outsole and prepare to draft, which will be the next stage uh, and also episode number six. So for ex ep episode five, we're actually showing you how to lay it out. So let me do this template. So again, I'm take from the tools uh, that we use. Again, um, rolling ruler uh, in a small, 
Um, a small uh, millimeter ruler. I usually use, actually use millimeters. This has uh, several different increments. Um, I got a basic pen uh, and a couple of markers, a couple size markers, and actually a, a graph, uh, a uh, drafting pencil, right? So what I'm gonna use, you sh probably should start with your drafting pencil in this um, stage. I'm actually gonna go straight to a pen. A uh, drafting p pencil allows you, if you make an error, you can obviously go back and erase it, all right? Um, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off. Um, I'm not even going to use the pencil. It's going to take me more time to actually do a secondary overlay in a uh, pen. So I very carefully place the last on the page so that I know I'm going to have enough space for my side walls. Uh, my lateral may be taller than my midsole, I mean medial side. So I'm probably going to inch it a little bit favoring the lateral side. I want to make sure my toe in my heel or uh, in a straight line. Uh, the heel view, um, it's gonna need about this much space. There's plenty of space here for the toe view. So then that's my final position. I'm gonna maybe mark it in a couple of places in case I get a little bit of slippage. Mark it in red. Actually, this particular part, creating this template, is probably where you, you, you actually, it's not probably, you actually have to be the most uh, careful. Because um, if you get this right, you'll see how it'll speed up the entire process. So, I'm gonna go ahead and mark this very carefully. Or, you don't have access to a last, you can also use an outsole. You know, buy a sneaker, make sure it's a size nine, or get a sneaker in a size nine that um, mirrors the shape that you want to build from, something related to the outsole that you're planning to design. Trace that, and that's also a pretty good guide as well. You'll see later on that I'll use uh, some templates that are based around outsole traces versus uh, lash traces. A little bit uh, precautious. I'll go over that again, tighten it up with the black pins to make sure it shows. Because there's a lot of layering that happens here. And you wanna make sure that you can see this clear uh, layering of pages. You wanna make sure you can see this clearly through a couple layers of paper. So I'm gonna go ahead and tighten it up a little bit with a black marker. Okay, so from there, the next step is, and if you notice, I got a piece of uh, uh, bleed paper, so I don't mark my, careful not to mark up your pen if you're using more heavier markers, you don't mark up your actual light board. Uh, the next next step will be, um, to take your rolling ruler, switch back to my pen, use your rolling ruler to catch Couple of lines. You want to get your toe line crossed like that, perfectly horizontal, and it should, if done right, your rolling ruler should match up to the top of your page exactly. Do the same thing on the other side. Use your rolling ruler, catch the edge of your heel. I'll show you why you're going to build this line. This is the uh, front and back end of your last. As a matter of fact, um, I'm gonna do the same thing off the side to catch the heel. Use the side of the paper as your marker to let you know that your rolling ruler is straight. See that right at the edge? Bring it back for your heel view. That's gonna show where your your uh, last is from the back view. guidelines to show where your last is at. You'll need these later. Same thing on the lateral side. Right where the last, if you were looking at it from the back, where does the last disappear at the side? Right at the top of the crest of this arch, 
touch it right there, bring it back. See that? Actually, I should have. What I should have did is to make sure that that line was straight. Check it against this one. Slip a little bit. Take it. Check it. Matched. All right. Same thing in the, the forefoot lateral side. Line up your rolling ruler. Side of the page. Down. Mark it. This roller is doing something weird. It's clicking on me. I don't know why. There's some feature on this. Yeah. Oh, it's got a clicking feature. Okay. Turn that off. Let me do that again. Roll it back. This line might be a little off. Mine is off, I'm gonna keep it just for sake of time. It's not too far off. It's not too far off. Come down and do a second line here. Again, I'm gonna check it because these need to be exact. Because if any, it's like mathematics on a household, um, even when you're preparing the design itself, if one measurement is off, the entire blueprint will become somewhat warped. See that? These are what I would call last guys. What I'm gonna lay next are gonna be the ground plane for the different views, right? So I use my last guys, which I know already are straight. And I bring it up. So what I'm thinking about when I'm bringing this up, I should probably for you, um, well, this is imagine. Yeah, I'm gonna, for you, I'm gonna draw a little guideline, but this is not, don't draw this, you don't need this on your template. Actually, I'm not gonna draw it. You gotta remember, if this is the last, the, the, the rubber is gonna sit up around there, about so, about like so on the toe, maybe like so on the sidewalls, like so here, right? This is where the outsole might, might end, depending on your design. Outsole might end here, and like so on the heel. Maybe, right, depending on the design. So what you wanna do is you wanna consider where the rubber might end, go a little higher than that. So your blueprint is tight and all the pieces, all the views sit together close. You don't, have the, you don't need to have a giant gap. And when you're working on a legal, uh, a tabloid size sheet, you can't afford to have a big gap. You have a big gap between where the round plane lays on this, this view is called the toe view. Um, what it'll do, it's gonna limit the amount of space you have to work with on the top. Actually, I've got plenty of space to work on top. I'm, I'm pretty sure my toe cap usually will end somewhere around here. And, and if toe view, even if I have a large flare on the um, side walls over here, which will show up on the toe kind of high up here, I got plenty of space to work, probably too much. Because if it's flare and all like that, really you don't need to show that. You just need to show where the toe cap comes down. Actually, there's gonna be a little toe lift area I'll show you too. If the toe lift comes up to here, toe cap ends here. You know, you got, you got plenty of space to work. So that's the ground plane for the toe view. I'm gonna next build the ground plane for the heel view. Remember, the rubber's gonna come out to maybe about here. So I'm gonna give it a little extra space because I do need a lot of uh, working space on my heel. Your heel may have a huge thing that comes up. You know what I mean? A lot of times, the heel doesn't have no lift, so it's gonna sit right on the ground. May have a little roll, maybe starts here, but it might go higher than your average heel, which is like a Adidas forearm or something like that might come up to here. But if you think about like, um, you know, a lot of the shoes now, they've got massive well, roll, the Nike mag, right? Type of wrap up in the back might come way up. So really this one is, I didn't do a great job of spacing it. I could have spaced this thing, whole thing forward a little bit more. So um, the toe needed less space and I have plenty of space for the heel, but you'll, you'll master that later on. Um, and you can always adjust, I'll show you how you can adjust in just a second. So I'm laying the ground plane for the heel. Put it like about here. It doesn't need to go all the way across because it's the ground plane. I mean, your house, the ground plane is where your sole is going to sit. It's not, you don't need the ground plane all the way across. Same thing with the toe. Same, all right, so now I'm going to build the ground plane plane for the lateral side on your template. We're building the outsole template 
This is episode number uh, five. We're working on uh, preparing your outsole to drive. So you gotta work out all of the mechanics. And it starts off with these. This is what I'm building for you is, you know, this is my patented process. I'm showing you how to build a template that you can, you only gotta do it one time. It makes drafting much easier. Other than having this template, you have to repeat this process every time you have to uh, do another overlay on your drawing. If you do overlay drawing, some people might draw this one time, finish their outsole on the first one and then draft it, but it's a really shallow drawing because it didn't have any thought. But if you, smart designers, maybe refine their drawings over and over using an overlay process, you don't want to be building this more than once. It becomes a real headache. But one time is fun. This is not, this is a lot, you know, it's a lot of fun if you do it one time very carefully, patent the process. So if this is the lateral side, my flare might come out to here, maybe. I don't think it's gonna come much further than here, so I, I'm gonna mark this as the end of where the outsole will end. I'm gonna put my ground plane right up beyond that. Been using my guideline that I used on my hill view for the last, guidelines for the last. I'm gonna go right here. Matter of fact, I'm gonna play it safe, and I'm gonna use the side of the paper as always the best measurement for the exact placement of your rolling ruler. All right, so I got a ground plane here. I'm gonna extend my ground plane. I'm gonna extend the later with my T-square. That's a basic, As a matter of fact, I can show you how to do that now. I also have a T-square over here that you use on the traditional drafting table to get that straight uh, angle off, the, but I'm using the side of the page. So I'm gonna take my T-square and this one, I'm gonna flip it because it's got a, I don't actually need to hook it. I just need a good roll, roller. So once I get my sideline, my ground plane on the lateral side, I'm gonna extend it a little further. Because remember, the toe might extend up to here, so you need at least ground plane that comes up to this line. And on the heel, same thing. I'll get it even with what the rolling ruler left me. Extend it a little further. Right. So we're making progress. Now I got one more ground plane, right? On the medial side of the last. I'm gonna lay that next. See how I laid it out. Last, last guides, ground planes. And then you can build up. There's one more thing we're gonna build up after we get the ground planes in place piece of tabloid paper. So I'm gonna say medial side flare, maybe the hair. I'm gonna put my ground plane right there. It should be sufficient. Then I'm going to make it a little longer. toe view and your final drawing I'll call this area generally is the toe. You don't have to mark this on your guideline. Medial. Lateral. Just for you. Um, and heel. If you write this, if you wrote that on your template, it might get in the way when you're when you design it later on. Um, so finally, what you want to put on your guideline, um, and I'm contemplating whether or not, I never put the, uh, like a rough shape for the outsole, because I already know that I have enough space and uh, I don't want to have a guideline that's in the way. Later on, I might decide to take some other totally crazy shape. You know what I mean? Or you know what I mean? And I don't want to have a guideline sitting there that whole time. But all of these, you're going to need all of these in place every time. And uh, what I'm gonna add in finally um, is the uh, rubber uh, thickness. So when you build an outsole, typically, depending on the type of outsole, you can adjust it, this, this part, um, customized based on your design. But usually, 
uh, with most outsoles, basketball and running and cross training, all categories typically give, um, we, um, a, there's a thing called the base rubber, right? So the rubber uh, that is uh, there even when there's no lugs or the rubber that the lugs sit on, right? Typically is 1.5 millimeter thick. And then you have, uh, we used to make big lugs that were like five millimeters thick very rarely back in the day chunkier outsoles mostly now you want to use a lug that's roughly uh, uh, four millimeters at the most thick right uh, or 3.5 if you're really being technical and you're considering your weight and you want your weight to be down but your lugs to be sufficient enough that they won't burn off really quickly um, so I'm going to use uh, and if that would leave uh, 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 four and then 1.5 of uh, base rubber it's called base rubber and i'll go further into base rubber as we go into this process you want to mark those you want to mark the spacing for base which is 5.5 millimeters overall so i'm going to go ahead where did i put my ruler and uh i'm going to find uh my millimeter marking i'm going to mark uh, first thing i'm going to mark is four millimeters and 1.5. I'm gonna mark that maybe three places across this each plane, right? Four millimeters, 1.5. Four millimeters. Because I got this down to a science. I'm going to go ahead and mark these all over. All right, so you know what comes next. Take that. And extend it. One of these is off. Yeah, this one is way off. tell something went off if it's not lining up with the other dots you don't want to have this again you don't want to have anything crooked you gotta check your math This right here is worth its weight in gold in this process. Um, you know, if you wanted to add any additional features, they would be add-ons from here. If you wanted to, like I said, like I was saying, um, if you decided you want to add, uh, you know, uh, toe lift, I would probably wouldn't put toe lift on without kind of at least giving a general idea of my toe shape, um, toe rubber shape. I know it's gonna look like that. All right, you can you can do that part without having to draw the whole silhouette of the outsole. Same thing with the heel. I know the heel may mess around and be like so. This is very random what I'm doing. Then I um. I might also trace that on here. So I know this is related. These are options, right? In terms of uh, building a temple. You may, maybe you wanna have this additional information on here, you don't. You know, a lot of times I like to be, if I, I like to be totally, if I'm building an alto, I don't know what I'm gonna end up with at the end of the day, I'm gonna put less information. Uh, and then the toe lift, uh, generally it looks like this. Maybe you want to include that as well in your blueprint. Give you an idea what your toe left might, might end up more than likely will end up looking like. And you can work that in 
to your design. You know what I mean? You already have that in uh, consideration already before you begin to draw to your design. So you can have that as a part of your template. I wouldn't put your heel roll because you'll find that in your design you want to have enough fluidity that if I want to make a sharp angle or a rounded angle or some type of bevel, you know, I don't want to be boxed in that far. You know, similarly, another option may be to draw on the rest of your silhouette. I'm, I'm not going to do that for sake of time here. I think you kind of get the gist of it. Uh, and then this template is what you use over and over. All right, so let's go to the next step. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the drawing uh, of the uh, ninja from Giza. Actually, this is what I use as my template. Again, a lot of times I go super shorthand. So on this one, you'll see that actually the last isn't marked. Um, I actually marked an outsole. This outsole shape is probably based off the, um, the shape of the uh, superhero uh, mythos and superhero hero all use the same outsole. Um, and the last from the superhero and hero we used to make that out. So, so I, I may use this to kind of draw the general shape that I can work within rather than using the last. You can see all the other guidelines that are there. I use the guides for the sides of the outsole generally. So this is kind of, uh, I use the short form for uh, the ninja. Uh, and in Giza in general, you see I wasn't as precise because it's my brand. I didn't have to really impress anyone with the tech uh, pack. So I just kept it to the point. But uh, you can see that that the end result is just as effective. Uh, this would have been uh, sketch number one, uh, which I, I abandoned uh, midway through the process for some reason. Um, sketch number two, uh, looks like this. I already kind of knew generally, again, I came in with a sidewall drawing uh, on, you know, kind of concept that I wanted to have pods. I just needed to refine all of the shapes. So in your early drawings, that's how it is. You know, it's kind of like, I know I want to have um, um, it, there'd be like three pods in this, and the ninja was designed for um, uh, spring 2019, so it was created uh, over the fall of 2018. Um, and it's fall of 2018, uh, this was a lot more unique. This was prior to um, the Yeezy drops that there was an Yeezy drop to shoot that looked similar like that. Um, and what else came out? This is actually um, prior to the, I think the same time the, the uh, Nike um, um, Vapor, Nike Vapors drop. So anyway, this is the second, uh, you know, trying to come up with some type of a story. It's actually, this is the end result of the, uh, the Ninja. And you can see actually already on this first uh, generation, I had already uh, nailed uh, this flex uh, articulation in the toe. I knew I wanted to have a stripe, the stripe is there, uh, but I hadn't figured out the lugs yet. Uh, knew I wanted to have some type of a large stabilizer, um, but I wasn't really sure of the shape yet. And so that's that's sketch number one. And you can see in the hill view, remember I said about the toe view, hill view? See in the hill view early on, similar to the way it came out, you know, um, but a lot of articulation is not there yet. So then sketch number three, uh, looks like this. Actually, sketch number three is clearly an overlay that needed sketch number two. And what I was working out at that point was um, how I would work out the, uh, add some, some, something a little bit more special to the shape of the, the midsole pods. And you can see, it worked out. You got these hexagonal, um, you know, somewhat uh, shapes actually on the sidewalls. Not much else going on as I did it. Uh, yeah, the midsole stayed kind of the same. I look like I'm messing around with the shape of the heel, trying to make it a little bit better. Uh, sketch number four. Um, has enough information that I can take away sketch number three. Uh, number two, just number four. You can see that the, uh, you know, this idea of having kind of like the uh, this this geometry, kind of diamond like uh, and diamond inspired geometry, uh, gonna take shape. Let's see something here. How does this match up? Okay, 
ground plane, matching the ground planes up. This one using the ground plane is a little bit lower. So I'm kind of working somewhat funky. I think there was too much space or I needed more space. So I, look how the ground planes dropped. And I, I kind of created a reset, a reset the ground plane on the lateral medial view. But in, the, in terms of the details, you can see uh, in this drawing, um, again, I'm getting that kind of a diamond effect that ultimately ended up being used on the final version of the shoe. Um, still no lugs, I, I stayed with the flex screws. These are flex screws actually in there. So if you look at the articulation of this outsole, although ultimately I ended up with these raised lugs uh, that are like ribs, if you look down in there, it's, got, it's cut in such su a certain way so that this flex screw is still there. I like that right out of the gate. And even the one that was added, I think in this sketch, was this X-shaped one under the uh, ball of the foot remain. And uh, there was already a deep articulation between the toe. I knew I wanted to have, but you see, I'm still trying to figure out uh, the way that this shape was going to be in here. Here, I'm like looking at a V shape. Can't remember if that was in the. It was in uh, sketch number three as well. Um, sketch number four. Uh, but you see the thought, you know, because I got all the lines down. I'm trying to trying to figure out all of the details. And generally, you got better get the shape first. Before you start to add your lugs and anything like that, notice I'm not playing with the lugs. I'm trying to maybe mess around with some graphics. You know, like the lugs could do something like that graphically. Ultimately, never ended up being a part of the lugs that I ended up with at the end. Uh, but I'm trying to get the shape down. Now you're trying to get the shape down. Notice the toe views in there now, right? I got toe view, disappear, reappear. It's maybe an overlay uh, to sketch number four. Let me place catch number four on a template. This matches up with the ground planes, yes or no? Yeah, there, yeah, it matches with the ground planes. That's how, that's how sketch four was used. You can see the template still in play, right? Sketch number five, uh, messing with the dimensions. If you look here in the hill, trying to figure out the width. A little bit of stabilizer chain, a little bit of stabilizer chain from here to here. Which one is closer to the end result? Somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Does that end up, you know, uh, this one is closer to the end in the heel. Uh, the stabilizer part in the heel is up more like this one, but I was exploring that shape. See how that works? You know, playing around, looking, this is some kind of, something that can happen with the articulation here. Possibly, didn't make the cut. All right, so we're going to, uh, I think I'll sketch number four. Sketch number six. Has enough of his own information that I can take away sketch number five. Match it up to the original guidelines. Let's see, does it match? Ground planes, back to the original ground planes. It's a match, right? Actually, I adjusted the ground plane again on the uh, medial side, it's much lower. The lateral side stayed the same. It's a weird sketch. I'll cut it off so I can see what I'm doing here. Playing around with more articulation, possibly here and here, in terms of the flex screws that I was talking about. You know, and just ever so minor changes, but it's it's funny. This is overlay number six. As you do more overlays, uh, you get a better feel for what you're trying to uh, uh, um, achieve, right? So very little changes, but it didn't cost me a lot because I already have guidelines down. I can whip these out pretty fast. But very, I can think maybe taking little nuanced changes right here on the hill. See, I actually added that uh, middle line, actually, which was on sketch number six. So on sketch number five, I didn't realize. It's actually on sketch number four. Uh, what about sketch number three? Let me go back and look at it. Uh, it's on sketch number three from the beginning. Oh, that this little this little center line was in sketch number two. So that's not added. It was actually already there. Um, so I'm working out sketch, uh, overlay number seven, and then I got a final one which, in terms of the shapes. I was comfortable with enough on sketch number eight. Comfortable enough on sketch number eight. I'm looking at the final drafting and uh, sketch number eight. I still hadn't, I 
change my mind on the shape here on this top line. I'm still looking at everything else. It's pretty much the way that it was. Let me see something on my... Yeah, everything else is pretty much... Some of this is interpretation of the factory, the actual thickness here. You know, I'm going to show you some wooden models of this as I... As I uh, after I drafted how it began. This kind of looks a little different than the way that I had even imagined it, but the end result is nice. You know, it kind of pops. There's always a little bit of interpretation that actually happens that you don't even predict. Uh, although it was designed very intentionally, right? Designed very intentionally, the uh, end result, a lot of times is even different. But, so after I got uh, these shapes down. I still need to figure out lugs. I know I want to have some type of articulated lug system. So in order to uh, um, limit the confusion, I wanted to wait till I got my shapes. Once I got my shapes, then what I did is I used a Xerox copier and I began to experiment with, I went through a series of um, exploration on lugs. And I'm gonna show you those now too. I'm actually gonna take away this template now so you get the gist of the, uh, how the template works. So, started off looking at doing some, I knew I wanted to have some type of uh, ring lugs. I specialize in ring lugs. If you look at the gondola uh, and a lot of other shoes that I use, I tend to like this type of traction story. This is, uh, the Ninja was designed to be an aerobic shoe. So I know I'm working indoors, so I didn't need a lot of, I didn't need a heavy lug, but I wanted to have some, some grip, I wanted to be grippy for indoors, right? Um, remember Giza's uh, first category is fitness. So this is fitness. This is the cross fitness category with cross trainers like the Hero Simple Hero and the uh, Mythos. Uh, um, and this was the first women's uh, shoe that was introduced. Uh, and it was introduced as an aerobic shoe. It crossed over into men's. Looking at those type of lugs there, that can serve that purpose. The first overlay, trying to figure out how I could space them on the toe. Again, interesting to see how it was good to see how it ended up and how I was thinking right out of the gate. Um, and I looked at this as I try to lay more of the lugs down. I realized circles might be a little generic. Um, as I brought it into the computer, I realized hexagonal was the way to go. Uh, I guess, I'm wondering at what point did I, must have instructed the factory, we'll see in my construction notes for this outsole. But actually, you'll see on the blueprint, there's actually not hex hexagons on there. So I'm playing around with uh, maybe a different type of uh, uh, type of lug I can introduce, ultimately end up making it. And at, at the beginning, I was thinking about using it all the way across, maybe having it kind of fused into these circular shapes. Later on, I real and I'm looking at X shapes, you know, maybe X shapes mixed in with some type of a circular shape. The X's ended up down here. Hexagonals up here. X's right here. Lines in the middle. But you don't, you can't come to a solution until, unless you do a lot of exploration, right? Deep exploration, thinking each one of these, I might have spent 15 minutes figuring out what would look different, what would look dope, right? Right here, you can see I began to realize, oh, I can mix and match. And I might have decided at that point, I can mix and match this way or, or any number of ways. I ended up ultimately mixing and matching this way. But it didn't happen by accident. The factory didn't put it on there. I had to uh, um, flesh it, we call it fleshing it out uh, through, through going to research. This is the final, what I would call very quick and dirty blueprint. I, I draft on um, the computer. I uh, started driving on the computer since about 2020, uh, 2003, 2004, all of my blueprints went into the computer, but because this is my own company, there's no need. To, the computer takes a little longer, but it's a lot more detailed. I slammed this out by hand, just because I just went for it. I knew that the factory just needed to understand a rough idea of what I was gonna build. Uh, my, my buddy Danny Shaw famously said, sometimes you get the factory too much information, you know, and you make them, they just, they just look at your general idea. There's some companies, when I was at Fila in 2015, Fila would just make drawings and send their drawing concepts to the factory and let the factory develop the entire outsole. This is somewhere in between. I, I just don't need to be super detail oriented like my computer uh, uh, draftings, which we'll see. Um, but, uh, so I, just, I did this freehand. Actually, freehand, if you look, this is not even, 
using uh, templates, um, you know what I mean, uh, to, to draw traditional drafting. This is done by hand. And this, these are my cross sections. Uh, we'll get into that later. I'm just gonna put these on the record so you can see it uh, now. So you can see that I, I articulated the way that the lugs should be. And let's quickly go through, let me look through, let me, let me, let me scrub these, uh, this project up out of a folder. And I uh, have these here. These are like the notes that I sent to the factory at some point. How did I do that? Oh, I must have imported it into the computer. And I added, see that? These are construction notes. This is um, one of nine. And I must, I can't, I didn't even remember. I must have taken this handmade drawing, drafting, put it into the computer, and then dropped the lugs on top of it afterwards, the way that I wanted them. See how the lugs came out? So that actually answers my question. And these are just instructions, color separation lines, right? Uh, flex grooves, right? Uh, these are the lugs that are raised, 2.0 millimeter rounded tread pattern. They nailed it. They nailed it. Exactly. Um, but I call it out, it's just kind of short form. These are rubber outsole areas. Motor DVA areas. Stabilizer area. Stabilizer looks like even underneath. They nailed it. Rigid uh, internal arch stabilizer. So this stabilizer is, is, is the, the ninja is made with what you call a flying. I call a flying arch. And since it's off the ground, it's part of uh, the uh, story, and they actually nailed that too. It's part of the story of when they fly an arch. You got to make sure you can become very uncomfortable if this is too loose. If it's, it's a cheap stabilizer. Traditional, they call them shanks. You sit in the arch kind of helps the torsion and keeps the arch from collapsing. So if you have a flying arch like the Ninja, you better have a pretty sturdy stabilizer in there. So I called out a, uh, a rigid internal arch stabilizer. They nailed it. Logo details, you know, accentuate, you know, reiterating there's a gap there in the midsole. They actually, yeah, the stabilizer doesn't extend right there. You don't want to stabilize the flex screws. It'll hinder the flex. So those are the notes from that. So from there, I got um, this wooden model came back. Well, actually, I got a shop drawing. We get a shop drawing before you begin to get the models. And this is generally we're gonna go into this in the next episode. We get into actual drafting. This is what a computer drafting looks like, aka a shop drawing. So I'll design a, a drafting, whether by hand or on the computer. Send it to the factory. The factory always sends back this tech uh, drawing. It's called a sh uh, shop drawing, uh, which is the blueprint. Uh, your blueprint interpreted with all of the necessary details that you may have missed. Uh, they put it in there like that. And if once you approve that with some corrections or whatever, then you end up with a, a wooden model. I, I don't have the wooden model on hand from the Ninja. I have these photographs that will show you. You know, I was super excited to see that's how they interpreted it. That's when I knew I had a, a winner. These are all of the parts per what I called out. All right. Outsole view, remember these your toe view. Your toe view match my toe view. Uh, I think that's the lateral. So the wooden model look like on the inside. And these are all the parts on the inside. Right? So that's the ninja. And that's that's actually how the this final shoe came out that way. Beautiful, beautiful design. One of my favorites. You know. So uh, look what I actually have here. These are uh, thumbnail sketches from the Renaissance. Uh, and custom, custom flagship shoe, original shoe. Uh, these are outsole sketches uh, for how I developed that. Um, you can see uh, from this early thumbnail that the logo was already designed in advance. Uh, the branding was developed in advance of the outsole. I knew I wanted to put the shield in the arch area. Uh, next, though, on this early sketch, um, you can see that I wanted to, I added the wings early on. You know, I was playing around with the wings and how I could actually get them to fit in, kind of add some type of architecture, graphic uh, to the wings. Look at this early version of uh, the way the wings look. And from there, um, I was playing around with, again, trying to break up the shoe so you got this kind of generic tread pattern area, two areas. Um, and uh, while playing around with that, actually I think this is first. I went from the wing and realized that I wanted to add somehow a Cuban link 
in there. Uh, maybe, maybe even this this uh, wing sketch was already available, and I needed space when it hit me later on in the process. I wanted to add a cube link. I just used this page to kind of get a feel for the Cuban link. I, I, I remember distinctly I was studying how a Cuban link could be drawn uh, here. And I just, maybe I just used this for a page. So this is two different stages kind of blended together on accident by coincidence. Uh, so then I went from the wings, I think I went here, blocking off the traction area. Uh, fairly generic at the beginning. And generic, usually when you put time into it, it becomes a little bit more elaborate. I figured out a way that I can add this type of shape uh, without going into what it represents. I mean, this shape to me, as I look at it now, reminds me, of, it's got a little bit of Dark Vader, Vader's mask on there. But I had these three patterns. I knew I wanted, I could introduce three different patterns. This one is actually cornrow in the um, ball of the foot. Uh, blocks, like regular squares, and then uh, 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 chain. I think I had the idea of doing the chain at that point. So maybe that earlier sketch was, um, you know, they, they, they were together. So then, uh, then I went back to working on the wings a little bit, you know, trying to figure out how I could make this. Because this wing is looking a little bit more generic. This one is closer to the way that the final ended up. Um, and then finally, I ended up with this as the basis for the outsole. And this is the way that the, the Renaissance actually ended up. You know, you got a, got a prototype here. The base actually ended up that way. You can see the... Um, I don't know if you can see it in the light properly, but you can see the herringbone. It's got these, this crown pattern. And then there's a, like a griffin, like lion uh, shape. A lion in the classic griffin shape uh, in this tread pattern. So we've got the three uh, tread concepts similar to the way that, the, uh, that one design was. Letters are all on there, all right? Got my signature in there too, I'll squeeze it in. Initials. So those are the, uh, those are one part of the design stage and then immediately you know you can see some of the inner you know as I got the outsole shaped the way I wanted it I gotta play around with the patterns okay I can use I dug up I did some research and found it pretty cool crown graphic found the griffin graphic and then I began to figure out how to lay them down in there and there was a challenge of trying to figure out exactly how to vector the herringbone uh, the Cuban link actually so that it fit uh, in, a, in a dynamic way in that, that midsole space. And again, this is prior to uh, any company having, in 2012 when I designed this outsole, everybody knows the Renaissance was designed actually, the tooling was in 2012. This is prior to anyone having Cuban Link anywhere on any outsole, hand hand. Um, so I was trying to figure out how to vector them um, to fit into the space. And I did a little bit of a little outsole study taking the Cuban links and fitting them along this um, kind of a graphic space, uh, vector space. And I was able to come up with that, right? Which is exactly what it used. Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six. The factory gave me one, two, three, four, five, six, but one of them dropped out. It's the in in interpretation that the factory gave in the shop drawing. I don't think I have the shop drawings handy. We don't need them um, for the Renaissance. And this was, uh, I actually ultimately fit it into the shape that I had. Um, a couple more drawings over here. Let's see what we got here. Um, this is ultimately the way that the, the, the uh, design came out on the computer. Oh, so it looks like I did that. When I added the herring bones into the computer and I drew them, this was uh, 2012, also number date on here. Date completed 10 October 22nd, 2011. Um, I had already actually myself clipped the herringbone that way. So the factory gave me exactly what I gave them. Um, this, I believe, is the original drawing, uh, final drawing of the blueprint. And that because the medial and the lateral side are identical other than the custom being added on the lateral um, I only needed to draw, it's perfectly symmetrical, see? I only needed to draw one side. I figured that out when I was drawing it. Um, I did draw the heel though. Designed the heel there, but in my drawing, I didn't add it. That, uh, before I, I added the heel view in the computer. I believe. Here's one, here, nope, 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 nope. Here's another drawing as I'm pulling these open as I'm talking. Actually, I had the outsole, the the, um, the hill view 
was actually drawn in the original drawing. See that? See the guidelines? Same process. Different levels of intensity depending on what you're building. This was my big chance to really, um, you know, do something out of the out of this world actually remember the the, uh, the renaissance i was aiming i was calling it the jordan killer when i designed it so this was meant to be a home run so uh i don't think i was cutting corners per se it was more so i, I knew i could uh you know speak to the factory how i wanted to but I, actually the renaissance i'll show you next week um has full-blown uh digitized shop drawing as a, a, a outsole drawing as opposed to a lot of the geezer stuff where i did shorthand you know um, and then I even designed, this is the sock liner of the Renaissance, which uh, famously, uh, this final version here, actually is an, is an air bladder. It's a, a full length air bladder uh, with a leather piece over the top. I'm not sure if this size nine doesn't have it, so I'm not gonna go there and pull it out of here, but the ones that went through production had an air bladder as a sock liner. This is a shoe called the Adam uh, One um, that I did in years ago, 2009. I had technology that uh, went into the midsole. Um, this was a template, pretty complicated template that I built for it. You can see I built the whole last actually on the template. Um, and uh, it evolved, I'm not exactly sure the exact steps uh, uh, that the shoe went through, but um, this is generally what I actually have. I think that's the same. The original template, um, that suit was all, it might be all three identical. And then it went through like various little uh, stages of researching how exactly I wanted to build the outsole on today. I'll show you these. And then it's, you see there's a uh, window there for the numbers, but I never filled out the sketch number accurately. I couldn't even tell you what order these are in. But it's the same process of figuring out what the design wants to be. I'm playing around on all of the different views. Actually, this one is from scratch, I believe. It must have been from scratch because there's not even a, a rough idea of how the sidewall will be. Ultimately, you'll see this box uh, under the arch. It also has a flying arch similar to the Ninja. Uh, this one had a, a box or a space that was built just underneath the flying arch. Uh, so you can put the device inside of it. Um, and it would never hit the ground based off of the way that the out, you know, it's kind of like tucked underneath a cradle. I was calling it the cradle where this text would go. Um, for a company called IDG. See all the different kind of iterations taken in consideration, the possibilities with the lines and the design and match the even studies of the lugs, flex screws, uh, taken in consideration what it needed to ultimately be. This was kind of like an engineering thought in the middle of this process where I realized that I could put a cradle and I was just trying to think it through, you know, how would the cradle sit and what parts go where on the stabilizer uh, in order to figure out the stabilizer itself. The Atom was actually prototyped um, I'll show those photographs uh, so you can see how it ultimately came out. And there's tons and tons of, uh, there was engineers that were working on a technology that ultimately went inside of this shoe. Uh, it had buttons on the counter, which is like the heel area uh, that, that uh, operated this technology that was underneath. that was inside of the cradle. You see the process is the same though. It's a lot of thinking, researching, and you begin to figure out certain lines to get them to the point where you are satisfied. Again, I'm not sure, probably this might be the, this is pretty close to the final drawing here. I'll just leave that there. Uh, which one was closer? Maybe this one is even closer. I'll leave this here for the final design. Um, you had, uh, I'm not sure which one of these are the final uh, drawing. I think um, this one is pretty close though. This is 
pretty close to what the final end up being. Um, but then, yeah, he had a lot of these little iterations, considerations. You know, the more time you, you spend on any design, I mean, there's a lot of options that begin to present themselves. So you can see the lines are really solid at this point, even with this, which I never used. Um, you know, it becomes pretty clear and you can have fun, but you gotta put the work in. You see how, how useful a template is like this. So this shows these, actually this one might be a little bit even more close to the final than that. So that's the, uh, the Adam one. Since we're going over to uh, Adam, uh, this was also another consideration. It was, uh, since it was uh, at some point I must have been considering putting air bladders uh, to hold that cradle up off the ground. Uh, I want to show these. These are some, also some pretty cool thumbnail sketches that were a part of this program. Uh, there was some shoe that I was going to try to strap a device on the side. Uh, and these are the, the, thumb, the corresponding thumbnails that go with that. Um, it's just, it was always a, a cool project to me. Um, check those thumbs out. Again, flying, flying um, arches. Trying to come up with engineering and a solution that I could actually hold a device somewhere on the shoe. Uh, there's a, a, a running pattern. Yeah, it's pretty cool thumbnails. Thumbnails are powerful in any way because you're always finding lines, like lay lines in a pattern. Um, based off of what the solution is to be. Ultimately, I ended up coming up with this thing here. Um, I call it, uh, this is the C1 uh, 1500. I think this preceded the uh, Adam one. Uh, this shoe and uh, uh, all preceded, it was about five or six different shoes. I had a shoe called the Falcon that also had this flying type of arch thing, preceded the uh, Duo Bionic, uh, the APU uh, simulator that we saw in episode one and, and two. Had a uh, you see the buttons on the side. Um, this is a game, supposed to have been a gaming shoe, which ultimately ended up being the APU was the gaming shoe solution that I liked. This had uh, you know my concept of how the technology could be put in, clicked in. This one has the tech right underneath the hill. Uh, I think I moved away from that because that's definitely not a good idea because um, the strike force comes down in the hill and uh, some. Uh, engineering department coming up with some corresponding drawings to try to match that, including these. You know, as they came up with a device, trying to figure out how to fit it in. This must have preceded, the, I'm wondering if this, this is 07 on actually on the sketches that I just showed you. So this preceded the Adam 1. Uh, so I had not yet even realized that the best place to put the device is not underneath the hill in the strike zone. Uh, this was some engineering drawings of Device look like on the outside, on the casing, on the inside, done by the engineering team. Um, it's got a an big antenna on the side of it. It dawned on me that uh, it wanted to go under the arch where it was safer. There's no strike forces that actually happen under the arch. You know, crazy, crazy stuff. Very interesting too. And uh, actually, this, this for what it's worth, it let it helped me to uh, gain an understanding for the, my, one of my ultimate discoveries. Um, and Stat Tech, you know, which is a digital technology that goes on a Giza product that'll be rolled out soon. Here's a couple of uh, additional wooden models. Uh, I don't have the drawings for these in front of me, but you get the gist from what we went over already. So pretty cool, uh, kind of a nylon plastic uh, a resin. This is resin, probably 3D printed um, outsole of the um, Hero Mythos and the uh, superhero. That was, that was what I saw before I saw the actual finished outfit. I knew I, uh, I, was, I was excited when I, when I got it. This was a shoe that was designed for uh, Giza. I forget the name of this program uh, in 2019. I ultimately ended up dropping it. I felt like it was, uh, it was um, just not exciting enough. I forget the name of this shoe. This was also a uh, Cross training, of course, is part of the fitness program during the time 2019. It's actually not bad as I look at it. I don't know if it was the outsole or the upper. I think it was something about the upper that was just really uh, annoying. It's interesting how they built this one. So the uh, midsole and the outsole separates, even in the, in the wooden model. And you have 
this shoe that was called, I forget it as well, uh, this might have been called the um, Hall of Fame, the name of this shoe, it was inspired by a Japanese style clog, I forget the, uh, I think they're called Gators, I think the shoe was called the Gator because of that, originally it was called the Gator, I switched it to the Hall of Fame, um, pretty cool luck pattern, I don't know if you can see that, it's got like uh, diamonds and hearts on it, it was under custom, uh, had a pretty cool uh, upper uh, concept as well. I'm pretty sure I flashed the photograph in there. Uh, it had like belted um, uh, uh, panels that came across, kind of stabilizing the upper pattern. I ultimately passed on it uh, because of the weight. When it came back, it came back really heavy, hella he heavy. And um, so I was gonna do another generation of it. In order for it to make the cut for a custom, it would have had to really be at least as good. This was meant to be like a follow-up on a Renaissance. The interpretation wasn't there. Interestingly, um, there's another couture brand, uh, the name is escaping me right now, that actually has the same type of a Gata inspiration uh, that hit, um, you know, it's hitting actually right now, it's 2023. I think it dropped maybe in the spring, possibly in the fall of 22. Uh, same type of concept. I'll put the name in the description on the video. It was Balmain that actually made uh, um, an outsole just like this. Theirs is, I think, uh, resolved better in terms of the way that they use the shaping and the spacing, but uh, same thought a little bit earlier than they did. Some parting wisdom for this episode. Um, I think it's fitting to talk about the importance of having a very, very well-developed uh, outsole as a part of your particular prototype. Me, I, I realized years ago, um, might have been five years into my career as a designer, that the outsole is pound for pound uh, the most important component on the shoe. You know, the upper is really important. Um, the colorway is, is very, very important. Um, and there are certain areas like the type of lacing, um, the fit, that they, that they are, you know, they factor very high in the value of the shoe. But, you know, I don't think there's anything that is as uh, important as or uh, conveying the fact that a shoe is great or not so great as the outsole. You know, literally every part of the outsole, the way that the toe cap looks, uh, the view from the sidewall, uh, the base view of the outsole, especially the base. When you flip it over and you look at it, if it looks whole hum, you know, it's going to feel whole hum when you buy it. Usually if it is whole hum, they didn't put no time into it, there's really no thought because it's not a special shoe, you're going to get that feeling from the bottom. You know, it's kind of under uh, considered. Not a lot of consideration put into it. Versus an outsole, you can tell when someone went ham, um, you can see it. And it doesn't mean just packing it full of information, just arbitrary information, but when it's just wisdom in the design, when you look at it, you're like, this thing looks like it can just start moving. Uh, it looks like, it reminds me of something. It gives me a very strong contemporary feel. It looks like a spaceship. It looks like I want to put it on my foot and walk with it. You know, that's the difference between uh, a great shoe and an average shoe. Just think about your favorite shoes. You know, I'm not going to name any, you know, but think about your favorite shoe. Usually it's not going to have a really dumb outsole on it uh, unless it was actually designed in a certain era where the technology was lighter I, I give it you know that benefit one of my favorite shoes has always been the Stan Smith Stan Smith is a very very simple outsole. well not even super simple because the tread pattern on the Stan Smith is what gives it that mark of uh, of excellence pretty cool tread pattern when you look at it you know look at the way the surface undulates between uh, the circular treads but um, you know, that, that's a rare occasion where outsole may come off simple. Every other outsole on, on any shoe you've ever uh, favored has something real special going on with that outsole. So master this craft. Once you do that, you're that much closer to being a great sneaker designer. That's it. Um, you know, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you in a couple of weeks for episode number six. Peace.